So as always, there's a lot going on in the space world, including the Axiom 4 mission, which has been postponed indefinitely, and we'll get into that, but I just wanted to make this quick update because I have a lot going on. I'm actually in Denver, Colorado right now. As you can see, I'm in a hotel room, and I flew here to go the extra mile for you and interview someone who I think you'll find very interesting uh, if you don't already have him on your radar, Blake Scholl, the CEO of Boom Supersonic, because Supersonic is back or will be back in the United States um, thanks to a overturn or a uh, repeal of a ban that was in place for quite some time. It's probably the only category where we've actually gone backwards because we used to have the Concorde and we could fly to London, Brad, very quickly and nicely. And today it takes you two times and three times as long. It's the only thing where we've regressed. We are making it possible for them to do supersonic and get us back on the track. I mean, we've, think of it, 30 years ago, we actually had planes that flew much faster than we do now. It took you half the time to get to a location. So we've regressed and we're going to progress. I interviewed Blake about what he's doing with the XB-1, and now they're going to be developing the Overture commercial airliner. So here is a little sneak preview of that. I had, I had sort of set a goal of uh, flying supersonic in my mid-20s. Uh, I would put a Google alert on supersonic jet. I figured someone will do this. I just want to know when I can buy a ticket. And for you know a better part of a decade, no one was doing anything. So I thought, okay, there's probably a good reason it's a bad idea. There's probably a good reason Boeing and Airbus aren't doing it. Nobody else is doing it. But let me just dig in. I want to, I want to know for myself, because I never want to be 80, yeah. uh, and think like, what had happened if I'd had the courage to look at that supersonic thing? Yeah. So I thought, okay, I'll get, in, I'll get two weeks into the research, and then I'll know why it's a bad idea, and I'll move on. Uh, but instead what I found is basically every single thing written on the Internet about why supersonic flight wasn't happening was easily provable false. Uh, and like one of the common patterns was people giving quantitative, or sorry, qualitative answers to quantitative questions. Like, oh, if you don't solve sonic boom and you can't fly supersonic over land, which is really, really hard, um, you won't have a market big enough for your airplane and it won't be worth building. Hmm. Okay, sounds plausible, but like, hang on, aren't there, isn't there a question of numbers here? What if you, what if you did Concorde? Uh, 2.0, and you flew supersonic over water, subsonic over land, but you got the cost down. How big, you know, would that be possible? How big would the market be? And, the, you know, and so I, what I started to find is like, when I started putting numbers against these things, the claims that were out there didn't add up. Um, and so uh, I remember the day I, you know, the basic idea was, let's start with business class. Let's give people a supersonic seat for the economics of a flatbed in business class. Mm. How much do I need to beat Concord by in order to make that happen? And mind you, this is 2014. The only thing, only aviation credential I have is a pilot's license, but I do have a spreadsheet and a web browser. And answering that question is a three-line spreadsheet, and the data you need to fill it out is all in Wikipedia. And the, the answer was something like 10%. No. I was like, wait a minute. You're saying that we could have a supersonic renaissance if we can beat 1960s technology by 10%? Uh, I was like, okay, well, I don't know anything, so how much better was the 787 versus the 777? How did it compare to the 767? And I was like, oh, every generation of airplanes is like 15, 20% better. Yeah. We can't find 10%? I mean, I don't know what I'm doing. Maybe supersonic's different. Um, but it, it didn't sound implausible. And then I, you know, so at that point, I kind of went to school. Mm. I went back and took remedial calculus and physics. I bought every textbook I could find. I took an airplane design class. Oh my gosh. Um, and I spent about a year just like trying try to turn myself into an aerospace engineer. Wow. I feel like there's so many parallels between your story and Elon's story. I mean, I was very inspired by what Elon had done. And I remember um, uh, one of the things I did very early on when I was trying to figure this out is I, I went and found some early SpaceX people. Yeah. Uh, I remember I flew down to, to Tucson. And I met with Jim Cantrell. Oh, wow. Who had, uh, and Jim had helped Elon start SpaceX. Yeah. And uh, I said, Jim, here's what I'm thinking. I don't know what I'm doing. You've been on the inside of one of these things. Yeah. And, and, he, and he said, I'm having flashbacks of when Elon called me for the first time. Keep doing what you're doing. Wow. Uh, and so that was, you know, I'm very grateful to, to Elon for actually doing it, for, for Jim for having had, you know, having said that, and a handful of other people along the way who, uh, who kind of said, y I know you think you're crazy, but like, keep going. Yeah. 
Also, another interesting thing that I found here in Colorado that I did not know was here is a SpaceX Falcon 9 booster on display not too far away in Littleton, Colorado. This Falcon 9 booster was put on display in November of 2023, and it's right next to the DISH Network headquarters. In fact, we can thank DISH for bringing this to Colorado. So there are only four ways to see a Falcon 9 booster on display in the United States. You could go to Kennedy Space Center and see the one hanging that was also used in a Falcon Heavy mission, or you could go to Johnson Space Center. There's one on display there. Of course, the one in front of SpaceX in Hawthorne, California, and this one here in Littleton, Colorado. Little did I know it was here, but it's really cool to see it again, and it really gives you a respect for just how big it is. And if you've ever seen Starship, they only get bigger. So I can't wait to show you my interview with Blake and to teach you more about Boom Supersonic because what they're doing is very cool and may impact all of us one day and help us get to the places that we wanna be much faster, which would be amazing. But let's talk about what's going on in the space world. So like I mentioned, the Axiom 4 mission has had multiple issues, the most recent being some issues on the ISS side of things. So of course the Axiom 4 astronauts are wanting to launch and go to the ISS, but unfortunately not only are they having issues here on the ground, they're also having issues up at the ISS. NASA and Roscosmos are investigating a leak on the Russian side of the International Space Station. As part of an ongoing investigation, NASA is working with Roscosmos to understand a new pressure signature. After a recent post-repair effort in the aftmost segment of the International Space Station's Zvezda service module, cosmonauts aboard the space station recently performed inspections of the pressurized module's interior surfaces, sealed some additional areas of interest, and measured the current leak great. Following this effort, the segment is now holding pressure. The postponement of Axiom Mission 4 provides additional time for troubleshooting and to evaluate the situation and determine if anything else is needed before we can get back to business. But that wasn't the only issue keeping these astronauts grounded. SpaceX decided to stand down from the Falcon 9 launch of Axe 4 to allow additional time for SpaceX teams to repair a LOX leak identified during the post-static fire booster inspections. Once complete and pending range availability, they will share a new launch date, which now, because of the problems up at the ISS, well, it might be a couple more weeks. Now remember, once Axe 4 launches, this will be a new Dragon spacecraft that's flying for the first time. It is the fifth and final crew Dragon to be built, the final one in the fleet. And remember, this actually caused some issues with Butch and Sonny's return because they needed to do additional testing on this new spacecraft. So obviously better to be safe than sorry, and so they will get up there eventually. So that's going on. Plus the FAA dropped into my inbox today to let us all know that the FAA has closed the Starship Flight 8 mishap investigation. So yes, that was still open during Flight 9 and we just have a little bit more information now. So of course, during Flight 8, no reports of public injury or damage to public property. The FAA oversaw and accepted the findings of the SpaceX-led investigation. The final mishap report cites the probable root cause for the loss of the Starship vehicle as a hardware failure in one of the Raptor engines that resulted in inadvertent propellant mixing and ignition. SpaceX identified eight corrective actions to prevent a reoccurrence of the event, and the FAA verified that SpaceX implemented those corrective actions prior to the Starship Flight 9 mission. So. Of course, this is regarding Flight 8. We still don't have <laughs> all the details we want about Flight 9, but eh, those will come out eventually. Also, speaking of boosters, New Glenn's second mission will take place net August 15th. You heard that. There's a lot of space in between the first and the second mission, and that is not what Jeff Bezos wanted, I'm sure. Blue Origin's Dave Limp says, following in the footsteps of our first booster, we've chosen the name Never Tell Me the Odds for Tale 2. One of our key mission objectives will be to land and recover the booster. This will take a little bit of luck and a lot of excellent execution. We're on track to produce eight GS-2s this year, and the one we'll fly on the second mission was hot-fired in April. 
But insider sources like Eric Berger think that actually the second launch of New Glenn will probably not be in August. It might even slip to later. Anyway, that's my short little update today. Thank you so much for watching this video and please stay tuned for future coverage of uh, my interview with Blake. I hope that you love it. I really, really, really enjoyed hearing his story. Um, it was actually interesting to see how many parallels he has to kind of Elon Musk's story and also how much inspiration. I mean, that's literally why he pivoted and dropped everything to go after this sort of crazy dream that now is becoming a reality. So it's a really great story. Hopefully you enjoy it. And thanks for supporting my channel. I'll see you in the next video.